All right. Thank you, Bafi. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here and suffering through the uh, technical difficulties. Uh, so as Bafi said, today I'm going to give you a bit of an update on what we've been doing on the uh, bunch of wires phi side specifically. Um, and actually, we're going to split this talk into a couple slots. Uh, JP will come up on sort of the second half, and you know, I'll give you the preview of what that's all about in a moment. So just to maybe sort of state the most important thing first, you know, this is really representing the efforts of the entire BOW Phi working group. Uh, you know, it's a really large and a very active team, and so I just want to say thanks to, to all of you. Uh, you know, I think this has really been a, a very collaborative and, and outstanding uh, activity, um, and so I think this is you know just something that I'd really like to recognize the efforts of the team, and I'm really just here reflecting you know, sort of all the the great output that's been done. So hopefully most of you here have already heard about this, but for those of you who have not, you know, again, this is you know really targeted at you. Uh, what Bunch of Wires is really all about is it's an open PHY specification specifically for die-to-die -die parallel interfaces. Um, and what we're really trying to do here is try to maximize the applicability of the specification across the broadest range of chiplet applications. And the sort of philosophical approach we took to enabling that was essentially to say, okay, we're going to define the minimum set of features that are actually required to make things you know, be interoperable at a reasonable level but allow design and usage flexibility to, again, enable this much broader set of applications to be built on top of a bunch of wires. So given that approach, you know, we've specifically optimized this to be working both in commodity, meaning organic laminate packages, as well as advanced packaging technologies. Uh, this really is intended to be, and you know, has been shown in practice, I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment, to be compatible with a wide range of package and IC processes. Um, and overall, actually, the performance metrics, I'd say, really are state of the art. Um, if you kind of look at this table over here on the right, you know, particularly on the energy efficiency side, you know, we're really right at the best that you'll see out there. Uh, you know, bandwidth densities and everything like this, again, are very much, you know, sort of right at the edges of what people are demonstrating these days. So again, the whole point is that, you know, the specification is attempting to be designed so that people can match the die-to-die -die interface to the needs of their specific chiplets rather than attempting to build the chiplets around the behaviors and uh, characteristics of the die-to-die -die interface. So as I said, you know, we really took a minimalist approach to just what are the things that are actually required to get people to be able to interoperate, but leaving flexibility and you know, the ability to essentially customize and tailor the designs to the specific needs of a given individual chiplet. So to just touch on a couple of the key aspects of you know, sort of how we went about trying to enable this flexibility while maintaining interoperability, I think one important one that you know, it sort of seems like a small thing, but it really is actually sort of a, a big differentiator, is that you know, instead of, for example, requiring a very specific bump map or bump pattern, the only thing we require is the order of wires on the package. Um, and so as you can imagine, you know, there's lots of tricks and games people can play with uh, in terms of their specific bump maps. And we obviously do publish representative versions of those to you know, sort of give people a starting point. Uh, but you know, once you've specified the order of the wires on the package, you know, that's actually the primary thing you really need to get the interoperability. And so this is a good example of this type of, you know, sort of specifying the minimum that's needed, but no more than that. Similarly, all bunch of virus files must support 0.75 volts. This is just to ensure sort of compatibility across a broad range of process technologies, but there's nothing in the specification that, that stops you from going lower than that, obviously other than just meeting all the overall requirements from an electrical perspective. So systems are definitely free to use other voltages to optimize for performance, bit error rate, reach, and so on and so forth. So on that note, you know, I, I wanted to sort of just briefly highlight the electrical specifications as well. This is something where we, again, spend a lot of time, you know, sort of trying to provide enough detail and guidance to people to know here, here are the things you really have to pay attention to from a phi design standpoint to make sure that electrically everything will interoperate properly. But there's still a lot of flexibility built in, in that, you know, just sort of says, okay, look, like, here's the requirements from a sort of higher level behavior standpoint from things like, for example, impedance profiles and, you know, junior profiles, you know, voltage uh, sensitivities and things of that nature. But how one implements things to reach those, again, there's quite a bit of flexibility left in. Another sort of thing that I want to sort of point out is that these specifications were developed essentially based on feedback from live in-flight designs, as well as from a large number of studies of particular channels and channel models that were contributed to the group by members of the community. Um, so there's actually quite a bit of, you know, sort of inherent knowledge built into the way these were constructed and, you know, the end uh, sort of numbers we're actually picking to, to require here. So I'd hinted at this a moment ago, but indeed, you know, there was quite a bit of work contributed by the community in terms of what are these sort of representative channels, what will they look like, what are the requirements we're going to have to hit to make these things work. 
Uh, so in particular, channel conformance, you know, we don't say anything about physically what this channel is or, you know, sort of specific, uh, you know, impedance numbers or anything at particular frequencies. We just say, look, if you meet the timing requirements uh, given a certain sort of set of reference transmitter and receiver characteristics, then you are indeed a conformant channel with a bunch of wires. Um, and actually, we're releasing open source software soon that will actually allow people to go and do that checking on their own channels as well. So if anyone's sort of interested in any of this, I would definitely encourage you. There's uh, actually a lot of reference channels, uh, both from a uh, design standpoint, from an S-parameter standpoint, and from a uh, essentially SI analysis standpoint that's available completely out there, you know, sort of for, for the world to see. So please do go check those out. The, you know, that's a lot of really valuable collateral if you're interested in starting to build some chiplets. So if just from a status perspective, you know, and, and Bobby touched on this earlier, you know, Definitely the, the biggest accomplishment was you know, the specification 1.0 was formally approved and released in July 2022. Uh, got quite very good reception, had a lot of you know, sort of strong backing behind it. Um, and I think really the, the next sort of important thing I'd like to, to point out is that really an ecosystem has actually already formed around a bunch of wires and it's being designed into products today. Uh, so there are known fine implementations in 65 nanometer, 22 nanometer, 16 nanometer, 12, 6, and 5 nanometer, uh, and probably even a few more that I just don't happen to be aware of. Um, and there are actually over 10 products that, you know, uh, I shouldn't say that I know of, but, you know, sort of are pseudo-publicly uh, sort of known that are being worked on, and again, perhaps even more than that. Uh, so there's a few just sort of eye candy charts here of, you know, various test chips and product plans, and, you know, sort of things being embedded uh, using a bunch of wires. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to sort of highlight a couple things here in a moment in terms of where things, you know, sort of springboard off from here. So the first is, as you can imagine, the whole point or one of the key points of a standard is to enable interoperability. Um, and so there's actually a big effort underway to show that interoperability. Again, Bobby touched on this, and JP is going to talk about this kind of in the second half of this talk, so I don't want to steal too much of his thunder. The other really important piece is, you know, besides just a core phi, particularly in the die disaggregation space, we really see sort of a, a dearth of standards that are out there sort of really describing how would you go and take essentially the on dynox that people are using and essentially disaggregate them across multiple chiplets. And so there's a really very targeted and, you know, I think a very uh, sort of important effort that we've been doing on the, what we're calling a link and transaction layer that essentially provides a mechanism for people to actually do directly that type of uh, approach. And uh, David Krakmeyer will be talking about that in the talk after this. So the final thing I wanted to just briefly highlight is that there is indeed also a 1.1 version of the five specification that we're well underway on now. And we're making really excellent progress there. And I just want to couple, you know, cover a kind of few key highlights from that in this, uh, you know, in the remainder of this section of the talk. So I'd say that from an overall goal perspective, what we're really shooting for in this 1.1 version of the spec is to just expand the use cases that are explicitly supported by the standard. There's a lot of things that one could sort of like take the 1.0 and sort of figure out how to do, but you know, we now want to capture them and make them explicit and sort of say, yeah, these are our best known approaches to sort of handling these additional specific use cases. So just to give you some exemplar sort of motivating use cases and features, um, first I'd say, you know, there's obviously many applications today that are either directly energy constrained or battery lifetime constrained, particularly mobile devices. Uh, so there's some new fine grained power uh, management modes that we've defined. Uh, there are some chiplets that are very specifically sort of shoreline dominated, and you know, there's kind of a couple of different versions of that. I'll mention one of them in more detail in a second. Uh, but because of that, we've defined the so-called half slices and are you know, sort of defining things up to higher data rates you know, for the corner cases where you really need that absolute peak of the data rate. Um, you know, there are some trade-offs there, obviously, from a technical standpoint that I'm happy to dive into if anyone's interested. To support things where you, know, you really need the interface to be explicitly brought up uh, very rapidly, perhaps you have some real-time applications. Uh, we've now defined sort of additional sideband slices that are just explicitly communicating information from one side of the link to the other. Uh, and purpose of doing this versus, for example, just using something like I3C is, again, just to get you the higher data and throughput you'd need to ensure a particular startup time. And then finally, for things like, you know, a chiplet may need to be configurable given the multiple different uh, products that it may be embedded into. And so things like configurable directionality, there's additional sort of specifications we've provided there to tell people how it is they should go about doing that. So just to give you a couple of, you know, sort of uh, feature highlights here, this is by no means exhaustive and by no means, you know, sort of most or, or best. This is just, you know, a couple of things that I thought would be interesting to, to mention here in this room. <coughs> so first on the power management side, we would find data idle and clock gated states. Um, these are now sort of explicitly supported. Uh, they were both, you know, very much targeted to be done without any shoreline bandwidth implication. So there's no extra signals being routed around. You know, again, in organic laminate packages, that tends to be a very, very important consideration. So there's like a zero latency data idle state that we've defined. 
and particularly in terminated signaling modes, uh, you know, that can actually save you easily 30 to 50% of your power, just, you know, kind of without really doing anything else. And there's also a one to two parallel cycle uh, sort of, you know, mode which is actually truly clock gated. Um, from a latency perspective, that's what it takes to enter and exit. And that can, you know, basically drop your power down into the, you know, five to 15% of what it would have been had you been active. Similarly, there's a number of applications, particularly on the sort of consumer side, where the actual chiplet size itself may just be limited by the shoreline, you know, literally in the like millimeter or two kind of range. Um, and so what we've done is we've defined a so-called half slice that just has half of the number of data lines, eight instead of 16, that just allows you to sort of fit a full duplex thing into about, you know, a little bit over a millimeter of shoreline, even with a relatively standard 130 micron bump pitch. Um, and, you know, it's not just that we've defined this thing, but obviously we've then gone through the exercise of figuring out what the interoperability of that would look like with full width slices, figuring out what some of the rules would be to ensure that, you know, these things are used and, you know, created most efficiently without sacrificing the interoperability side of it. So just to quickly summarize before I uh, hand over to JP, um, you know, a bunch of wires really was very uniquely designed to allow adopters to select and trade off between package, process, performance, and complexity without needing to switch to an entirely different data die standard, you know, simply because you need to be in a slightly different point in that design space. Bunch of wires is available now. It's being actively adopted, you know, largely in the data disaggregation space. Um, it's completely openly licensed. There's no NDAs, no signatures, you know, and basically anyone can, you know, come and participate, uh, you know, help drive the specification, help provide feedback, you know, just use it. You know, th there's really kind of no further steps you need to take other than just, you know, sort of decide to do so. Uh, I have provided a whole bunch of, you know, sort of links here for additional information for those of you who are interested. Um, and as I said, please do just, you know, come join us. We'd be very happy to have your inputs. So with that, I think I'm going to hand over to JP. He's going to do the second half here. We're just going to focus on the interoperability stuff. Maybe we can just, uh, you know, if there's any questions or anything in the meantime, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to field them. question? Yes. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> You're making your way over. No problem. <laughs> so I'll ask the obvious question. Uh, you might have talked about it. I uh, entered it in the middle. Uh, UCI. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so uh, there are some uh, IP vendors who uh, provide both solution, you know, whether if you like that or, or the other. Uh, but it's really, it would be in the benefit of everyone if you know everyone coalesce around a single standard, so if you can comment about that. Yeah, no, so um, uh, I'll be a little bit careful what I can say just because, you know, there's certain things that, that, you know, I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> um, basically, for right now, what we see is that from a technical standpoint, there are differing decisions that are made um, that, you know, as we've kind of highlighted here, a bunch of wires seems to be really much more well suited to the die disaggregation application. Uh, whereas UCIE sort of both philosophically and technically kind of adopted a PCIe-like approach as, as implied by the name. Um, and much of what was built there is really very much driving towards what I call more the package aggregation space. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, there are use cases for both of those. And so that may be why, you know, at the end of the day, there is actually room for coexistence there. Um, having said that, you know, I think there are various ways that convergence, you know, one could imagine convergence to happen, um, you know, whether those occur that way or not is, you know, somewhat of a different question that, you know, certainly I don't have the, the direct control over, so to speak. Um, but I think for now, you know, there's, there are strong technical reasons to, to sort of actually have both. Um, and I think the applications are sort of separated enough um, that it may actually just make sense even from a sort of overall, you know, delivery and everything else standpoint. Uh, but, you know, over the long term as these things evolve, you know, obviously the communities are, are closely intertwined, you know, uh, Blue Cheetah is a member of UCIE, for example. I'm sure many others in the audience here are as well. And, you know, those, those kind of explorations continue. No, please, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, so I'll repeat the question. The question was the uh, 0 0.75 volts that, you know, that has been defined as the interoperable one, does that have to be the same as the core voltage? It can be something else. Um, no, it's, it's, BOW doesn't say anything about that. It's, it's totally up to you whether that's a separate IO supply or linked to the core. You know, the spec, you know, spec doesn't say anything either way. Yeah, of course.
can I use your laptop? Yes, yeah, well, it's Robbie's, but yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Thank you, Alad. <coughs> um, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jayaprakash Balachandran, go by JP. I work with Cisco. I lead the POC and interoperability work groups, ODSA. I'm here to talk about an open platform that we are developing for interoperable testing of BOW interfaces. So uh, as Elard was mentioning, we expect the future A6 to be completely disaggregated, composed of multiple chiplets. And uh, important, more importantly, these chiplets, we expect them to come from different vendors. And uh, the top of the mind question, if, it, if the chiplets are sourced from multiple vendors, is really interoperability. Today, the chiplet designs are done by one company, for instance, Intel AMD. They actually develop all parts of the chiplets. So interoperability is not that of a concern. But when you are actually sourcing from multiple vendors, interoperability is a key concern. In fact, as we are working through the standards, BOW development, this came as a primary requirement and this drove the work for us, right? <coughs> and uh, so as you know, any protocol, any IO interface has got a, uh, multiple layers. And today for interoperability, we are actually focusing on the file level interoperability. And later on, we'll take up the data link and transaction layers, right? So this, we believe this will bring a lot of confidence to the adopters of the BOW interface. And <coughs> So what we are doing there, first is actually everything starts with a spec, BOW 1.0 spec. And we have two of the vendors, Blue Cheetah, Airlog, and Dmatrix. They're developing a silicon phi interface chip uh, test chips. And then in the spirit of OCP, what we're doing is actually we're developing the package and the, and the PCB for doing the interoperability as a community effort. So unlike the other, like PCAE or others are Ethernet interoperability test, we need to develop the package. This is a chiplet level interoperability <laughs> testing. So it requires package development first, right? And then uh, it requires a PCB to actually test the package and also the software goes with it, right? So it's essentially a, uh, <coughs> a set of chip package and the software and this is being developed as a completely open platform and at OCP ODSA, right? Uh, so with that, we hope to um, uh, do the interoperability testing and then finally, we publish the reports for the community. Right. <coughs> so this work would not have been possible uh, without the participation of number of companies listed here. On the left hand side, what you see is all system and OEM companies or cloud vendors. On the right side, we have the five developers. On the middle, we have package development companies. And we also have academic institution from India, IIT Delhi. So this community is actually well represented chip package, and, uh, and then five analog designers. So it's a very vibrant community that allows us to develop uh, this uh, BOW interfaces as well as this open platform. Right, so what we have here as an interoperable substrate, so what you see here is a 40 by 40 millimeter substrate with uh, five test sites, right, which I call here as a TS1 to TS5. So, and you can see here, there are interfaces that runs 20 millimeter and then five millimeter, the two different lengths, which is what we think as the range of length for BOW interface. And then, uh, so to establish a baseline, we have um, <coughs> a die from the same vendor talking to itself. For instance, DMA to Dmatrix or beach blue cheetah to blue cheetah. So this will establish a baseline before we test the interoperability between two different phi implementers. Right, so <laughs> the TS2 and, and uh, TS4 are really the interoperable test case. And what you see is the TS3 is in a very interesting test case which came out as a requirement as we are discussing through the standards. So this actually talks about the phi in different orientations. One phi is oriented away from the other die about 90 degree. And this will cause a lot of skews. So this is an interesting use case or com and predominantly coming out as a major use case. So we want to validate that, and we'll have results soon when we <laughs> analyze this. So overall, we have 10 dies, fighter structures, ranging from length 5 millimeter to 20 millimeter lengths. <coughs> so this is actually a design summary of where we are. So we, this is going to be a 40 by 40 millimeter flip chip organic package. And this will have a 525 packet substrate. 
and 130 micron bump edge and with one millimeter ball pitch and we'll use a low loss dielectric GL102. Right, so, so this is a high level summary. The most important aspect any package development like this, uh, especially running at high speed, is really the signal integrity. And right side, you can, I mean, the left side, what you can see, the two dies we are testing for interoperability, you can see a very dense layout, right? What it means is the dense layout is really the, a uh, lot of signal integrity issues. And on the right side, what you see here is uh, the frequency domain response. Uh, and then the bottom, you can see the I. And from the S parameter plots, the frequency domain plots, you can see we're able to achieve a very good uh, insertion loss, return loss, and crosstalk characteristics. In fact, the number one challenge for this type of chiplet design is really the crosstalk, and we are able to address that. And we're able to achieve about 70% eye opening in this case for the interoperative case, which is actually a pretty healthy margin. Right, this took us some time, but now we have the know-how and we are sharing with that community. If you're building a BOW interface, we'll be sharing all the know-how, how you can build it, how you can avoid crosstalk and achieve a healthy margins. <coughs> right, so the next effort, uh, the major effort, I would say is really the bring up uh, PCB definition and uh, <coughs> uh, design. And uh, what you see here is actually um, uh, yeah, the intro package and, and then driven by a CPU module. And the CPU module will drive the test for the BOW interface with the programmable power supply and clocks. With this, you'll have a very flexibility of AT engine in your lab bench. Right, so this will allow us to test remotely using Ethernet or USB, and you'll be able to uh, stimulate this uh, BOW package uh, and run different tests with that. Right, so where do we stand now? So right now we are actually uh, complete, we completely lay out SI analysis has been done. And right now we are working on the power integrity analysis. This is another critical challenge we are addressing. Uh, this is some, uh, so we hope to complete that in about a uh, uh, week or two. So by November, we plan to have this out, this substrate. And, and then we'll have that uh, PCB done and then software developed. And by April next year, we'll, have, we'll be demonstrating the interoperability. So we have all the pieces in place, so it's a kind of execution. Right, so, so a lot of effort still needs to be done and a lot of challenges to be addressed. The chiplet interop test definition, validation, interop to bring a PCB design. And we're also interested in defining a common API for chiplet diagnostics and test. And a lot of challenges to be solved, as I mentioned, these chiplets run at high data rates with multiple parallel interfaces, brings a lot of signal integrity and power integrity, right? <coughs> and if you are working, if you have expertise or if you, are, and you want to enhance your expertise in these areas, please join us. Uh, we meet weekly from uh, and Wednesday, 10 to 11. So <coughs> please join us in uh, these efforts. And uh, that actually brings me to the summary so, so we had, uh, at ODAC, we are developing an open platform for interoperability testing of BOW interfaces. We hope to demonstrate that interoperability by April uh, next year. And this will facilitate the commercial deployments uh, for uh, many BOW interfaces in flight, or BOW designs in flight. And as Bopi is mentioning, this is the first of its kind for effort in chiplet designs. And also for the OCP, this is the first project we're doing doing the complete uh, package design in, com in open. Right. <laughs> and uh, so join us and drive the chiplet revolution. Thank you. I, I do want to say, um, please, Bill. Yeah. While Bill's coming up, I, I want to say we want to thank uh, Meta and Google, we were there, especially DJ here for taking, giving uh, their, for some funding on this. And that's all when Jay said, right? For it's all when Jay else. said, yeah. But we need more money, so if you have any money, we need it. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank so you. are you looking, thinking about having this as a um, uh, academic research paper that we could put into the literature so that you can always point to it and set um, Absolutely. Thank you, Bill, for mentioning and, that. And yeah. So we are uh, we are working with academic institutions as well. So, but in this case, IIT Delhi. And uh, so there are some cool challenges we addressed in the signal integrities and the power integrity space, which we love to challenge. I mean, we love to uh, we love to share with the Google community. So, if anybody is doing this BOW interface, that would be of helpful to them to accelerate the adoption. Yes, I think. Uh, um, Bobby attended, well, he was a speaker at the, uh, at the IEEE um, packaging conference just last month. And I'm sure that uh, the academic side mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. knows very little about this, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And I think it will be very, very good if this work can go to the academic circles Mm -hmm. And they have some research students study this. A couple of thesis papers coming out. I think it will be a set up very good base for for this kind of a work. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, Bill, for mentioning that. And, and if there's anything, I can help. Absolutely. We'll get in touch uh, with you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the first step is organic. As the BOW interface matures, so we'll, pr we'll consider that uh, more advanced packages. Right now, the BOW spec targets organic substrates. So or maybe next year, we may have, who knows, we may have an advanced substrate targeting for a target for BOW. Use money, then you can build anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, I mean, I think with, uh, with, the, advanced <laughs> with the advanced substrates, obviously, you, you need a, hey. it's a very different set of costs. <laughs> I, I don't have David's and apparently you're about five minutes behind. Uh, wait, where's David? You're David, right? Oh. No, he's here. Okay, uh, I don't have his deck on my laptop. He, he really is here. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you.